Hey everybody, welcome back to Sounds Like a Drum, Kate's independent media production. Today, we are exploring a couple of words, a couple of terms that are wildly misused, often misunderstood, said a lot in the industry that we need to get a handle on. Resonance, sustain, and we're going to demonstrate those things. The world of drums is loaded with terminology um, and loaded with people who feel differently about what these words mean. And these two come up a lot along with the term tone, which we're going to kind of fold into this in a minute. But we've been talking a lot about sculpting sounds, about how to go toward a sound that you have in your head or maybe recreate a sound that you've heard on a recording, things like that. And tone, resonance, sustain, these are all over the place, in addition to being all over the place when it comes to products. And today, we are going to dive into this. We're going to go deep. We're going to go deep on the big floor, Tom. And before we even really get into this, um, we would like to just sort of demonstrate three iterations of this drum at a single tuning, allow you to listen to them, and then we're going to kind of reverse engineer what we did here. Now what you're hearing in this demonstration is a series of iterations where we are reducing sustain and maintaining some if not all of the resonance of the drum over the course of these three sounds. The purpose of this demonstration is to show you the difference or the separation between sustain and resonance and help to sort of clarify that they are interactive, they are connected to each other, but you can affect them separately. And a lot of times when people are talking about one, they really mean to be talking about the other one and it can result in a lot of confusion and it can affect everything from how you play to the mix that you end up with in the studio. For those of you who aren't familiar with this drum, this is my floor tom, it's a GMS 16 deep, 16 diameter. We have coated G12 on the top, clear G1 on the bottom, tuned basically the way that I normally tune it. We chose this drum because big floor toms can often be a little bit tricky to deal with when we're talking about sustain and resonance and things like this, just by virtue of the weight of the drum. It's a big drum, it's on its side, and we have it on legs that are bolted to the side of the drum. So there's a lot of opportunity for a lot of aspects of the sound to get lost just by virtue of gravity, basically drawing the drum down into the floor. The standard maneuver for me with drums like this is to tune the batter in the range that I like the feel of and the pitch of, and then go a fair bit higher with the rezzo than you would normally expect. With rack toms, the rezzo is generally between like a half step and a whole step, or you know, E to an F sharp kind of range, higher than the batter head. With a big floor tom like this, sometimes I go a little counterintuitive. I'll go as high as maybe a fifth higher on the bottom. So we're talking about like the two notes of the theme from Star Wars, the first two notes. Lower on top and then up a fifth for the bottom. Now the complete sound of the drum, sometimes we call it the tone or you know, there's a lot of words for that, is the complete 
experience of hitting the drum from the strike all the way until you don't hear it anymore. We are talking about components of that. And the first thing you have when you strike the drum, the attack or the transient, that moment that the stick meets it, we are talking about everything that happens right after that. We've talked a lot about articulation and other things. We are talking about from that moment on. And the sustain essentially is how long is that from the transient, from the strike until when basically there's no more sound coming out of the drum. Resonance is somewhat of a different animal. It is again associated with sustain. They are intertwined with each other because they're part of the complete sound of the drum. But there is such a thing as a resonant sound that doesn't have a ton of sustain. That tail after that initial transient just isn't that long. And if we are talking about one and we mean to talk about the other, we're gonna experience a lot of confusion just for ourselves trying to tune the drum to have more of whatever it is that we're actually going after. If you've ever experienced drums, maybe your own drums or other people's, where when you're sitting at them, you hear pretty long, boomy, big notes, maybe out of the toms, and then you move away from the kit, someone else hits it, and you're not hearing any of that, that's an excellent example of a drum that has a ton of sustain, but not a lot of resonance. On the other hand, a fair amount of vintage drums that I've played that have very rounded bearing edges, some modern ones too, have sort of almost like a gated, shorter sound just acoustically, but because of the amount of energy that's entering the shell at that tuning, you're getting a lot of resonance and you end up with a rounder, fuller sound at a distance. Having said all that, what did we do here? Well, the first thing I did is tuned up the drum, felt good, sounded good, doing what I was expecting it to do. Then, we added booty shakers to the feet, which are a great product that do basically exactly what you would imagine. They add a lot to the drum. They allow it to resonate a ton, and they really add any sustain that's possible there and maximize the resonance as well. What that results in is basically a situation where everything that's in the drum that wants to get out can because it's got this kind of nice cloudy floating thing going on. It's up in the air and the shell can do whatever it wants because we're not losing as much to gravity from having it sitting on the floor. If you've seen our older episode about sandbagging the legs on the floor, Tom, that's kind of the opposite. That was a situation where we wanted weight on the legs to drive sustain into the floor and shorten the sustain of the drum without choking the resonance because we're not adding anything to the head so they're still able to move freely. The second iteration is the drum on its own, on its legs, sitting on the floor. And immediately you hear the sustain is shortened, but the sound of the drum is essentially the same. I'm feeling the same kind of resonance coming off of it into my leg. You know, the harder I hit it, the bigger it gets. These are the things that we're looking for. Now there have been times with this drum, um, particularly on stage situations where the floor is not super hard or on a riser that gives a little bit, where actually I struggle sometimes to get a good amount of resonance out of this drum because it's going past the point of losing sustain and actually losing almost all of the sound into a kind of um, cushy surface underneath the drum. And that was the first time that I really started thinking about this phenomenon a lot. Also, for what it's worth, your choice of floor tom legs can influence this behavior a ton too, whether you have like suspension feet on them, the diameter of the legs, the length of them, the brake angle of where they come out before the feet are attached. It all influences this kind of behavior and really affects the sustain and it really, really affects the resonance. PSA that we have a lot, it's really important. These are all good, valid sounds. There's nothing wrong with any of these. If you're talking about right and wrong, what you're really talking about is context. Is it good for the context that you're in? These are all super useful. 
We don't need to worry about which one's the right one or the best one or anything like that. These are just options. That's all it is. And for anybody, you know, who is feeling like dropping a comment to say which one is the best one or which one is their favorite, I do invite you to remember that these are also drums happening in a vacuum. There's, there's no context here of any kind other than just these microphones. And it's really important to think about these things in terms of the context. If solo drums are what you're thinking about, some of these sounds can work better than others. If you're thinking about certain kinds of music, certain styles, other ones will be better. We have to keep our minds open. We have to keep our ears open and understand that these options are for things. These are tools that we can use to be the best thing for the music that we're making. All right, door number three, drum number three, we have gone one step further and we have done the cotton ball trick, which is basically a handful, maybe 10 cotton balls, kind of squeezed into a mat, put inside the drum, resting on the resonant head, sort of against the shell, because it's tipped toward me a little bit. This is gonna take us into a little bit less resonance, a lot less sustain, a much punchier sound. Here you go. This definitely takes us into punchy town. It sounds really good. We're starting to get a little more overtone going on. Totally usable sound, very fun for articulate, kind of fast playing, things like that. This is also behaving like a thing that you may have heard of. Maybe you have one yourself. We're talking about gates here. Basically what a gate is, is a device. It might be in your signal chain. It might be a stomp box. It might be a plug-in. And it's just about setting how long you want the sound to be. It's chopping off the ends of things to a degree that you set it so that you can have a shorter sound if you maybe have too much sustain or if you just wanna modify the behavior of the sound overall. And this is kind of like a natural gate because when you hit the drum, these cotton balls weigh nothing. So they jump up in the air a little bit inside the drum, a little bit of resonance happens, a little bit of sustain happens, and then they drop down and they squash that sustain by essentially muting the bottom head. But since they're not stuck to it, like tape or a moon gel or something like that, there's an opportunity for there to be some play for that head and to activate the shell and give you some tone and some sustain and all of those things that we want before they drop down and kind of gate the drum out. Now obviously the sustain has been diminished a ton. There is a small loss of resonance because of how short we've made this sound, but there's still resonance in the drum. When you get away from it at a distance, you can hear that tone at a distance because we're not squashing it too much. This is a great hack. We've used it a lot here. We had cotton balls in one of the drums here for months at one point because we just got used to the sound. But the important thing here is that the fundamental behavior of the drum, the range of the sound, the feel of it, pretty much the same from the top, but we've been able to modify it ever so slightly to make it fit in maybe a denser mix or denser playing in general. Now for those players out there who love very low tuned drums, this might be a moment to, to take to heart to think about a little bit. Um, when we talk about resonance, one of the big things that we're talking about is the shell itself and whether or not it is involving itself in the sound that you're making. L super low tuned drums that have a lot of slap and a lot of sort of low tone right where you're sitting oftentimes don't project much resonance because there's so little tension on the heads. The shell is basically, if anything, getting a little bit muted by the presence of them. When you start to have pressure from the hoops onto the shell through the head, you are involving those things together so that when you hit the head, the shell is actually receiving this vibration rather than just hanging out while the head is sitting on it. This is how you get drums that give you a fat sound away from the kit and not just where you're sitting. And this can be challenging. You don't always need it in a recording situation, but in a live situation where you want the band on stage and everyone to have sort of a complete experience of the kit, making sure that the heads 
are making the shell resonate is gonna make that difference. It takes a little bit of experimentation. It might take having somebody else play your drums and have you get away from them a little bit. But believe me when I tell you that if you have heads on your drum, you put your hand on the side and hit that drum and you don't feel that shell move, you're not really utilizing the drum, you're really just utilizing the heads. Now again, we're deadly serious about this. There's nothing wrong with that kind of tuning. There's nothing inherently wrong with it at all. There's tons of use case scenarios where it's the right choice. We had a ton of fun with EMADs on the floor tom tuned so low that you could take the screws out with your fingers. The point of this is not right and wrong. It's understanding that if you're miking stuff close, that's gonna give you the sound that you're after. If you need that tone to project, then start to experiment with getting the shell to resonate because that's where you're getting lateral projection out to the audience and also to room mics. All of these are usable. All of them have their right place. This is about having more options and not about who's got the right choice for what they're doing with their drums. All right, that about sums it up. That was an adventure. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and hit the notification bell below so that you can hear about all of our new videos, many of them over on the Patreon. If you'd like to help out, please follow the link below. There's a ton of extra content on there. Our symbol series is in full swing right now. Swing, terrible. And <laughs> there's also a lot of other chitter chatter on there. Great community and you know opportunity to get in contact with us directly as well. Last question is, Tell me about your sustain experiences. Tell me about your fixes if you actually ran into issues with sustain because I know that when I started to experience that, I was kind of at a loss for what to do other than to just put a ton of stuff on the batter head or maybe the resonant head too. That never got me what I was looking for and now that we've had all these opportunities to experiment, I've found some things that work and I'd love to hear what yours are.